Hello, I'm delighted to be here with author and advocate Megan Phelps Roper to discuss her lived experiences combating polarization and the role of formal and informal education in doing so. Megan, thanks for joining us. Your childhood was uncommon, though I imagine it was impossible to know that at the time. Within the confines of the Westboro Baptist Church, however, you were surrounded by educated people, many with postgraduate degrees. You also ardently pursued an education yourself, perhaps motivated in defense of your worldview, a worldview you kept for 27 years. How did you reconcile your learning and your education over the years with many of your more extreme beliefs? You know, I've used this analogy before. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Um, but I, I've used this analogy before of um, it's like being inoculated when you're indoctrinated, you know, when, when you are taught, you know, this this kind of all consuming worldview from such a young age as I was. Um, it's like being inoculated against, you know, outside beliefs. So before I ever had a chance to have any questions or doubts um, about what I was being taught, I was taught by my by my parents and by my elders in the church um, that you know here's what people are going to say to you. Here are the doubts that are going to arise. Here are the, the chapters and verses that show why those things are wrong. Memorize them, and then you know again I was also uh, protesting with my family almost um, every day on the on the streets of you know my hometown and then all across the country. So I was constantly being put in conversation with people who were challenging my beliefs. Um, and being surrounded by these like very highly educated, um, you know, very analytical people, um, who always had always had an answer. There was always a, a very logical, you know, apparently logical. I mean, it, it follows from the from the premises, um, you know, their their beliefs. And it's 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 all consuming, and it seems like they have the answers to everything. Um, and and so when I you know went to school. I was absolutely, you know, there were people there who challenged my beliefs, but I had already been taught what the answers were and how, how to confound them. And in the places when there were just direct contradictions and maybe not enough evidence, I just understood, well, my, my understanding, my logic has to be subsumed to this ideology because this is the all important thing. This is the only way to save your soul. Were there particular moments in your education that you found challenge, particularly challenging to work your worldviews? There were a few moments. Uh, for the most part, I was a very, you know, the, the church, my mom used to um, quote this, she would say, um, you could sum up the Bible in three words, obey, obey, obey. And as her oldest daughter, you know, I, I was kind of right there at her side all the time. And, and these rules and norms and beliefs, you know, I was kind of, as, you know, as I said, marinating in them. Um, and so it's... Um, it was something that I, I just, I took to it and I understood this is the way that I, this is the way that I survive in this environment. Um, and so for the most part, I kind of instinctively shied away from those things, even though I, you know, was a very curious person. Um, I would say like the, the most danger as the church would, would put it, that I came into was like in middle school where, you know, I'm you know, just becoming a teenager and, and surrounded by other like very rebellious kids um, who were not raised the way that I was. Um, and I started to develop these, you know, friendships um, with people in my class. And, and I started to, started to wonder like, are they really as bad as I've been taught? And it was an unconscious thing um, for a while, but the moment it became conscious, it was something I knew I had to immediately shut down. And so I did, I understood that there was, there was danger for me there, that these were people who could lead me away from the truth. Um, but aside from that, from my education itself, from my teachers, like I, I don't recall any, any actual um, you know, interaction or thing that I learned that, that, that actually caused me to reconsider my beliefs. That's interesting, uh, Megan, because I know several years ago, there, the evolutionary anthropologist and author Avi Tushman theorized um, that improvements in learning and increased education uh, over several decades actually correlated with stronger partisanship. In, in short, that people become more resolute in their general ideology versus it, um, you know, challenging their ideology, generally speaking. Right, be, right, um, because of the, uh, like, post hoc justification, like, you learn how to better defend what you believe, and that's, that, that was absolutely true of me as well. Interesting, but you did change uh, your beliefs, and right. having believed and preached and evangelized beliefs for so long, 
Is it difficult to trust your current system of beliefs? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, when I was growing up, my mom would quote this verse all the time and it went, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and who can know it? And the implication was always that we couldn't trust our hearts and minds to tell us anything valuable about the world. Um, and yet there was this other well-loved passage that I eventually realized was a direct contradiction to that idea. You know, we said that we knew that the Bible was true because we had an unction or impulse on our heart. And so it was directly appealing to our deceitful, desperately wicked heart. And I came to realize that ultimately all we have is our heart, our own judgment, our own understanding with which to try to get at the truth. At, at the bottom of everything, it is our attempts to understand. So, you know, that's an inherently terrifying proposition for someone who was raised to believe, you know, that you had to have unquestionable truth um, to live in the world. And so the way that I've made peace with this, you know, seeming, you know, contradiction or, or paradox is that, you know, I adopt this posture of epistemological humility is how I put it, how I saw it put once. Um, and that immediately resonated with me. Um, which is to say, you know, I believe what I believe, some things more strongly than others, but I also recognize the limits of my understanding. You know, I recognize that the human mind, including mine, is subject to all kinds of cognitive biases, you know, confirmation bias and groupthink and motivated reasoning and more. And that I need to be aware um, of those things and open to questioning and to re-examine what I believe, um, you know, to be open to changing my mind in light of new evidence. And so, you know, while at first that lack of certainty was really terrifying to me, I, I now find it enormously liberating. And, and I think more to the point, I think my current posture is a far better representation of reality, which is that I, I don't, of course, know everything for certain. Um, and it's a far more productive and meaningful way of, of living in the world. So I guess mm -hmm. the, the short answer to your question is I, I still believe what I believe, but I also constantly am thinking like, what if I'm wrong about this? Like how, what if this other thing were true? What if this other argument is better? And, and truly considering it, which is something that I was not able to do while I was at Westboro. I appreciate that you, uh, that you characterize that as a liberating feeling as much as it might be terrifying in some ways um, that it opens you up to this exploration of other perspectives and to challenge your own thinking. Absolutely. How do you feel we as Americans, how, how do we know if our worldview is trustworthy and how do we discern fact from fiction in the current media environment? You know, we were talking about things like confirmation bias. So given the current able to use in the past. Yeah, I mean, I think disinformation and misinformation in, you know, this current media environment is obviously a huge problem. And I think, you know, part of it is cultural. I mean, like the technological issues are absolutely there, but, but what you're asking me sounds like, you know, like what can we do as individuals? Like assuming we can't control all of the social media companies and, and what everyone else in the world is, is doing or not doing with this technology, what can we do? And I think, I think the answer is being aware of how easy it is to manipulate, um, you know, our, our deepest emotions, you know, the, um, what it, Tristan Harris calls it, you know, the race to the bottom of the brainstem, these ap appeals to, you know, our lizard brains, basically. Um, it, the, I think the more we are aware of our ability to be manipulated, um, I think that's really important. Um, because when we engage with, you know, material on the internet, um, knowing that it could be, that it could be wrong and that we shouldn't just trust it blindly, um, I think keeping that in mind is really important. And so looking for multiple sources, look for multiple kinds of people you know, with different kinds of beliefs and the more they, you know, are, are sharing, you know, the facts, like what, what is true, like that will help us determine whether it's, it's something that we should be more likely or less likely um, to actually put our base, any other beliefs or actions on. So I'm extremely skeptical, I guess, is the answer. Like I, I recently read um, Trust Me, I'm Lying by Ryan Holiday, which is, you know, this fantastic, it is so, it was written in 2012, way ahead of, I mean, ahead of its time. And even at the time, it's kind of terrifying what he was able to do with just straight up lies and to get them published in major newspapers. And so this is, uh, it's definitely made me even more aware of, of all of our ability to be manipulated and, and the importance of being skeptical. Yeah, and that healthy skepticism. And I appreciate that you were talking about both the, the quantity of sources that you're looking at, but also the quality of them too, and sort of checking, checking the bias and doing that due diligence individually. 
What has the experience of leaving Westboro and taking up the work you currently do meant to you? I mean, it has been incredibly meaningful. The it, it's hard, you know. I, I write about this in my book. This the the moment kind of of epiphany where it first occurred to me that the church might be wrong. You know, this thing that I had dedicated my entire life to, and and all of my mental and emotional, you know, energy, intellectual energy to defending this ideology that I was coming to see as not just wrong, but incredibly destructive, both in the lives of other people and in the people within the church, these people that I loved and loved so dearly. And so to suddenly look at your whole life and, and kind of believe that, I mean, it, it's that, that turn was horrifying and devastating in more ways than I can articulate. And, and so to have left, you know, when, when I left, I, I really believed that there was, there wasn't really much hope for me. Like, I, I mean, I considered changing my name, but you know, that's, you know, the internet is forever and I, there's pictures and videos of me doing all these things. And, and, you know, beyond that, I, I came to feel this responsibility um, to make up for, or to, tr or to try to repair some of that damage that I, that I felt I did in the world. And so to have the opportunity to do that, um, to actually connect with people who had been hurt by the church and to people who were going through similar situations, you know, people who, I mean, in parallel, I should say parallel situations, because it's not just people, you know, leaving extremist, you know, religious ideologies, but, but you see this now in, in politics and all kinds of um, social um, situations now. And I think so, so much of the country right now is, it has become, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, these, these kind of same, these same things that tripped up my family at Westboro, I now see so many of those, you know, in the world at large. Um, and that was really surprising at first. But again, to answer your question, the ability to take those experiences that I feared had lost all value and meaning and had become just essentially universally hor horrifying in my mind, um, and to try to do good with them and to and to feel like I actually have been able to do some good with them. Um, it's kind of redeemed my life, if that makes sense. Mm. What, what do you feel that experience taught you about the American public, the American people? I think, I mean, part of it is, you know, the, I, I talked about this in, in my TED talk and I was actually kind of afraid um, at the time. I, I thought, you know, people are not going to let me make this comparison. Um, but the parallels between the way, you know, the tribalism, I should say, in, in the political world, um, all around the world today, is very emblematic. You know, this kind of dichotomous thinking, you know, black and white view of ourselves and the people on the other side, you know, kind of the inability to recognize or acknowledge, publicly acknowledge, especially when our side is getting something wrong or when the other side is getting something right, you know, because the important thing is that we win and they lose, right? They're, um, and that kind of zero sum thinking, you know, there's, there's so many parallels, the strategies that are used to keep people in line, the use of, you know, shame, particularly to, to keep people in line, um, and to kind of towing this line of orthodoxy, um, you know, all of these things, you know, I, when I first left, I, I kind of, you know, saw the world with these very rose colored glasses. And I thought like, like, I'm free, <laughs> like all of that stuff that constrained me before it's gone. Um, and, you know, it took me, I would say maybe like a year and a half after I left before I really started to see like, whoa, this is not, this is not just Westboro. This is not just other, you know, kind of fringe religious groups. This is human. And in some ways that's actually a really hopeful thing, you know, because, because if, if I could come to recognize this, even though, you know, ha having been raised in this extreme environment where, you know, so much of what I was, you know, able to think and feel and do was so tightly controlled. You know, there's, um, if even I was able to see outside of that, like who, who can't under the right circumstances. And so I kind of think of it in terms of how do, how do we create the right circumstances such that we can like help ourselves view where we're going astray and, and kind of show people the way back. Yeah. Megan, you mentioned that you weren't sure how people were going to receive um, some of what you were putting out there in your TED Talk, in your book on Follow. 
and that your views of things did have changed and evolved um, since since the time when you first left the church. Um, presumably, there's been a range of responses that you've gotten, both affirming and critical. Can you tell us about some of those reactions and responses you've gotten and how that's changed over time? Yeah, absolutely. So it's actually really shocking to me, you know, in in the early days, you know, as I mentioned, like I, I didn't think I didn't think that the world would be able to accept me. You know, I, I had been so public and so zealous, you know, not, not everyone that in the church is so loud. I, I don't know how else to put that as I was. I mean, I, I was a very strong believer and I was extremely active and, you know, and so because I had been so loud and so public and particularly on, on Twitter, um, you know, I thought there's no way I'm ever going to live this down. And it was honestly truly shocking to me when I essentially published this kind of letter of apology and explanation. I gave one interview, um, you know, this, a friend who kind of wrote up a little bit of what happened and, and the details. And when I published it, I was basically expecting, you know, the world to end or else either, either the world would end and I, I was, you know, going to be sh completely shut down forever uh, or, or that like nobody would see or care anyway. And that was kind of the best I felt like I could hope for. Um, and instead there was this enormous, like overwhelming, you know, there were articles published all over the world and all these places that I had been, you know, giving these, you know, interviews and, and publishing this really destructive message in the past. Now are publishing the articles saying like, I was wrong, I'm sorry. And to see that extremely generous and gracious response was the last thing I expected. You know, Westboro's view of outsiders is that they're essentially horrible people who are only, you know, m moved and motivated by their own self-interest. And to see this, this generosity was just incredibly moving to me. Um, it's really sad to me to think now that I honestly believe that, you know, just the way that things have played out over the last, you know, decade or so um, since I left, if I had left even a couple of years later, I think the likelihood that I would have been met with that kind of response on social media, um, it gets, becomes far less likely the longer it goes on. You know, there's, there's this kind of current focus um, that's way more on, you know, punishment. Like if, if people are being, and this is, this is not an if, people are being eviscerated for a single tweet or maybe a handful of tweets from a decade ago when they were a, a teenager or something and their lives are torn apart for it. And I think about the fact that I've got 20 some thousand tweets that I posted at Westboro that I didn't delete when I left. You know, they are kind of this example of, you know, the, the potential and the reason, part of the reason I didn't delete them was that, you know, that's a reminder of who I was and our ability to change and evolve and get better, become better people over time. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's really sad to me the the way that the, we've kind of in, it's like the tribalism has led us to these, again, very tribalistic, you know, uses of, of shame and, and um, punishment to try to make people do what we want. And that's, that's very Westboro-esque. And I, I, I really miss those, those early days. Mm. Well, let's talk about Twitter and social media for a little bit, because while the platform has certainly gotten more than it's, you know, more than enough criticism, perhaps for not being the most nuanced platform uh, for communications, you actually credit Twitter uh, with expanding your understanding of the world and your eventual departure from the church. Uh, so, and, and many called for you to be expelled from the platform for hate speech as well. Um, but you found yourself in conversation via that platform with people, you know, across the world with vastly different ideas and backgrounds. Do you mind sharing how that came to be um, and how Twitter was instrumental in, uh, in your departure from extremism? Yeah. Um, so it was, it's really fascinating. I, I got on Twitter to spread Westboro's message. Um, that was our our primary goal in life was not to persuade people, which we didn't believe we had the power to do. You know, we thought only God could do that. So, so I, I went there to spread our message. And, you know, at first I was using the, the common Westboro, um, you know, tactics, which were kind of outrage and disdain and condemnation. 
um, because those were very provocative and they tended to get a lot of attention, especially on, on Twitter. Um, but pretty quickly, like several things changed, you know, first I'll try to be concise here. First, the character limit, you know, it's funny cause you know, it, as you say, it, it does get a lot of, um, a lot of flack because you know, you're not allowed to be as, as nuanced and, um, but for me, it, it was, it was revolutionary because first it stopped me from using these, um, you know, insults, these ad hominem attacks that my family would just regularly throw in at the end of a very compelling, like, you know, sound, I mean, theologically sound, <laughs> seemingly sound argument, um, and then just like toss in an, an ad hominem at the end. Well, on Twitter, there wasn't space for it. But then I also discovered that when I did do that, I could watch the conversation derail in real time. So Twitter being this like immediate feedback mechanism, um, where I can see exactly how this how this strategy that I'm using is working, or in this case, not working. Um, and so, how how could I keep the conversation, um, you know, on the rails, right? Uh, talking about what I believe was actually important that this was, you know, the only hope for mankind. So I should I should be articulated in a way that that people can actually hear it. Um, and then, of course, the character limit, you know, forces you to be concise to say, you know, for me it became like a game. Like, how can I say exactly what I'm trying to say with no extraneous information and, and that kind of forced concision? It was just, it was amazing. Like there were so many things about it, but, but the most important thing about it, I think, was that I, again, I was put in conversation with other people who, many of them reacted the way that my, um, like people did on the picket line, these are very acrimonious, um, you know, encounters that I had with people, you know, on the, on the picket line were also happening on the internet. Um, but then there were people who, who were able to kind of step back and like, even if they did come to me really angry at first, they would, um, recognize that I really believed that I was doing the right thing. And, and so they, it kind of would cause them to rethink their condemnation of me. And then, so they would start asking questions and, you know, getting into these, in these, you know, conversations and, um, and they were able to understand where I was actually coming from and they were engaging with what I actually believed rather than a caricature of what I believed. Um, and in doing so, they were able to find, um, I think there were two different kinds of arguments. There were, you know, the, the theological and logical arguments that, you know, um, you know, where they found internal inconsistencies in Westbrook's doctrine, that was incredibly powerful. Again, coming from a family of lawyers who essentially worshipped logic above all else, like that, I mean, functionally worshipped logic, not, not theologically. Um, but that was extremely powerful um, to be confronted for the first time in my life with an argument that I didn't have an answer for and that clearly showed that we were wrong. Um, and then there was the emotional side of it. You know, this it was like the kindness of the people that I was meeting on Twitter um, was itself a contradiction. It was, it was, you know, confounding this thing that I had been taught that outsiders didn't really, didn't really care about us. They didn't really care about each other. They really just hated each other and they hated God. And, and to have these relationships that lasted and conversations, um, the fact that it's happening on Twitter, you know, a protest maybe lasts for a few hours at the very most, but on Twitter, I was able to develop rapport and, and these relationships that ultimately became incredibly important in my life, both in functional and instrumental in my leaving, but also in my integration into, you know, society, you know, to, into the larger world and the ability to, to function. Um, and I'm incredibly grateful for those people. They have truly changed my life. There's a biblical verse, Megan, that you utilized uh, to justify your interactions with users on Twitter, perhaps, perhaps feeling that civil conversation would bring them to the church, yet perhaps it had a counter effect. Um, can you tell us about that verse um, and what the effect was of you using it? Yeah, so this this is actually an example of another uh, post hoc rationalization. So I had already, because of my interactions on Twitter, um, come to this way of um, functioning online, and part of it was, you know, as I've said, the um, a result of just the 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 structure of the platform itself. You know, the you know not putting in the ad hominem attacks and such, um, and the concision required by the character limit. But part of it was a I was reflecting the way that people on Twitter were treating me. So they were asking me questions, and you know, and so it was something that I instinctively did back. 
And then I stumbled upon this verse. You know, I was getting a, I was starting to get in a little bit of trouble for this. You know, I had, you know, certain people, one of my aunts, you know, kind of approached me and was like, why are you talking to this person on, on Twitter so much? Um, and so of course I, I, you know, I, I give her the, the best response I can. And then later come upon this passage. And the passage was, by long forbearing is a prince persuaded and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. And I, I'm getting chills. <laughs> like, like that also like was revolutionary. The idea, you know, Westboro's view of themselves as, you know, these strident, you know, they're preachers of the, you know, the, of the gospel, the one truth. Um, and, you know, we give no quarter, we are unambiguous, you know, this kind of very hard line. And to find this passage in the Bible was like, oh my gosh, like it's here too. <laughs> like it's like even the Bible, like, you know, this is, this is not a bad thing that I'm doing. This is, this is a, and, and, and I just think that verse, I still believe, absolutely believe in that verse. I, I'm, I'm not religious anymore, but there's so much, so many things in the Bible um, that absolutely stick with me. And that is one of them because I think it's just, again, functionally and practically true. Like we don't persuade people through that kind of angry, hostile, shaming rhetoric. We might, you know, be, might be able to like, you know, push them, you know, to do what we want in certain situations where we have power over them. But true persuasion happens when we consider where the other person is coming from and appeal to, um, they call it moral reframing, right? Values that we already have to try to help us um, move from, you know, kind of one place to another. So is it safe to say, Megan, that you still believe civil discourse is the best strategy to reach understanding? Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, and this is I, I, you know, people I feel like this gets so much hate on Twitter, <laughs> um, not just on Twitter, but, uh, you know, in general. And it's incredibly frustrating to me because I mean, I, I understand it, though. Like, that's the other thing. And this is why I don't get angry. You know, I, I, I can't help but remember who I was and how I was in the world. And when I see other people behaving in the same way, like I, I know what it's like to do that and to, and to truly believe that you're doing the right thing. And that reminds me, you know, there's um, the epigraph of my book is this line from the great Gatsby that says, reserving judgment is a matter of infinite hope. And, you know, to me, that is, I mean, that is grace. That is the ability and the willingness to look at other people as being on a journey um, and that they will not forever be the person that they are in this moment and that there is hope for them to grow and change and that we can help to push people in, you know, in that our actions matter. In other words, that how we treat people, how we talk to people absolutely matters. And I think when we, when we take that seriously, it helps us be, you know, a lot more mindful of the ways in which we choose to communicate. Mm. In addition to that sort of individual responsibility to recognize one another's common humanity, do you feel that Twitter and other social media platforms have a responsibility um, to promote learning and to combat disinformation? And if so, what do you feel the responsibility is? Yeah, so this, this is a really hard question, I think. Um, you know, a lot of the time I, I feel like we are emphasizing these kind of structural solutions when it's a really a cultural problem, um, or or rather, it can be best changed by culture. Um, you know, I, I was actually reading this passage uh, from my book last night about you know the First Amendment. You know, Twitter and Facebook are are they are absolutely private companies. They can do what we you know essentially what they like um, within the bounds of the law. Um, but the principles of the First Amendment they, they don't just they don't stop you know, being good principles just because it's a private company, you know, functionally, again, these days, places like Twitter and Facebook, that is the public square. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, we should, you know, make these essentially take over, have a government take over of these companies. But I think, and I wish, and I hope that they do and will recognize their role in that conversation and to be less willing to interfere in that conversation because it seems like when we when we've seen like what happens when they put their thumbs um on the scale um to push things in in one way or another um and and by that i mean things like you know for instance you know anybody who was talking about the lab leak theory um for covid um you know those kinds of people were tossed off the platform um and 
And now we see there's a lot more evidence for it um, than, than, than we were allowed to know about because they made that conversation off limits. Um, and so it is uh, what they do real, and how they function as a company, what, what, how they run their platforms, it does matter. But I think the, again, the, the openness, right? The ability to have the conversation, that in and of itself is an incredible public good. Um, and I don't think we should throw that away lightly. Does that make sense? Have I actually articulated? <laughs> it does. And let's, I, I'd like to shift and talk about another system, which is the education system. Um, in your book, Unfollow, you shared how most of your teachers ignored the existence of Westboro, but you had a high school teacher in particular who allowed you to speak about your experiences with a great deal of candor by, uh, through asking questions. What was that teacher's role um, in your eventual departure from the church, and what can educators do to help young people to understand, to probe where their beliefs um, come from, to, to question and um, sort of like what we were talking about earlier, to really question and probe their own beliefs and their own biases? Yeah. Um, so first, that teacher, um, Keith Newberry, my high school English teacher, um, or one of my high school English teachers, uh, he was amazing. Um, it's really funny thinking back because, you know, you know, I mentioned earlier that I never had an experience in school where I learned something that immediately caused me to rethink um, what I was learning at Westboro. But he still played a really important role um, in my departure because when once I did finally come to the point of of questioning and doubting Westboro's theology, um, I felt like I could go to him. And in fact, I did go to him, right? So um, he was one of the first people um, outside of the church that I went to and spoke with and started, you know, he was, I would say, you know, part of that kind of de-radicalization process, right? So I, I was in conversation with him in those, in that time leading up to, because there was about four months between, you know, the moment I had this epiphany and the moment I left the church. Um, and it's, it's kind of funny to me that, that he, that was the first, you know, basically the first, um, you know, person I, I went to because I, I trusted him. His openness um, and his willingness to have that conversation made me feel like in this moment where I am, where it really does feel like the world is ending, um, that my life is over. Um, I knew and felt that I could go to him and that he would help me get answers. And one of the things that I loved so much, um, both during that process and when I was a student, was that he never did that thing where he put his thumb on the scale. He was never, I never knew what he believed about religion. Like he, I know now that he is a non-believer, but he, he was not, he was not pushy or aggressive about trying to make us think the way that he thought he was giving us space to have our own thoughts and to have our own thought processes and to work out, you know, questions of like, we had these journal entries, these questions of ethics and, and, and again, having a space for that, like coming from Westboro where everything that you thought was handed to you. Um, it was just, you know, kind of magical, um, and really powerful in hindsight in ways that I, I wasn't aware of at the time. Um, but now you ask like how, like what can teachers do in their classrooms to kind of, um, and I think this, I'm going to, I'm going to put us back on epistemological humility, like demonstrating that in their own teaching. Right. And, you know, maybe not every class is conducive to this, but, but things like, you know, when you're articulating what we know or our best understanding of what we know, um, you know, also articulate the kind of evidence that would change our account of the situation. Um, I think we should be willing to like say directly things like, I don't know. And I don't have a strong opinion on that because I don't think there's enough evidence either way um, to not shame people for not having an opinion, an opinion on things that, um, that are truly difficult and, and not, you know, not easy to, you know, um, not easy to know. Um, and, and I think, just generally, like the more we can be explicit about the limits of our understanding, the better, you know, the more we demonstrate our own willingness to change our minds in public or even to celebrate, you know, others changing their minds rather than seeing it as kind of a shameful or embarrassing thing. Um, the more we can help students not be afraid to do the same. And it, it's kind of funny. I mean, I even do this with my two-year-old today. <laughs> like when she makes an argument that convinces me, like I articulate exactly what she said that changed my mind and why. I mean, it seems like a, a simple thing, but I think that 
like having that kind of posture of forever learning and forever being open to the idea that you might be wrong uh, is, is incredibly powerful. Mm. And, um, and great fuel for curiosity to also point out where the gaps in information are, where we still need to know more. Um, that's great. Yeah. When you were writing the book, Unfollow, the shadow of your loved ones from your past life in the church is really clearly present and felt. Um, the cost of reconciling and bridging with your brother and people outside of the church has meant disconnecting from your parents. And today, more people are finding themselves in somewhat similar situations where red lines and values have severed families and friendships. And there's been so much um, on this recently. What advice do you have for people who are reconciling with that kind of loss? Yeah, I mean, this is incredibly sad. You know, it has been incredibly sad for me to watch how this has played out. And and one of the saddest things to me is is the memes, you know, that kind of show up around this question. You know, um, it's it's a very it, it is a very Westboroian attitude, right? This idea that, and I, I'm not trying to condemn everybody who has you know had some disagreement with their family, not at all. Um, but I'm saying that this like kind of hard line you know, line in the sand, I will have nothing to do with you because you believe something differently than I do. Um, even on a fundamental issue, like that is something that I take, I take that incredibly seriously in my own life. You know, when I, when I left the church, I remember feeling so much gratitude that I didn't have to do that anymore, that I could have relationships, that I could maintain even good relationships with people who see the world in ways that are fundamentally different than I did. And so that, you know, people religiously, you know, people, Jehovah's Witnesses became my best friends like shortly after I left the church. Um, and Jewish people, secular Jewish people, and, you know, all across the spectrum, you know, to, you know, uh, Orthodox and, and, you know, Christians, even though I'm not Christian anymore. And, and so, and I remember just feeling so much gratitude for that. Like, oh my God, the world lets you do this. And now it's, it's almost, it feels like this kind of self-imposed, um, no, no, you're not allowed to because of this. There's, there's, and it comes from, I think there's a couple of places. There's kind of a sense of guilt by association, right? Um, that's part of it. But part of it is, it feels like this, um, this family member or this friend is, they really are transgressing this, value that I hold so dear that the idea of, of, of engaging with them is incredibly painful. And so I, I decide I can't, I can't handle that. I can't do that. Um, so I guess I would say a, a few things like one is be very careful where you draw that, where the line itself. And two, remember that, you know, people aren't changed in isolation, right? It's in conversation with people who believe differently. Like that's where the hope for change is. And even if you don't feel like you can have, or maybe, maybe, maybe your past experiences has demonstrated, has demonstrated that you can't have a civil conversation about this one thing. But I also think we, we sometimes risk being blinded by the few things that we disagree on and lose the incredible value of the relationship on all of the rest of the merits of the relationship. Does that make sense? So it does. And I think, you know, I think it's important for us to differentiate too between when it's an ideological difference that is a difference of opinions and, and evidence and belief. Um, and I mean, certainly there are instances of people who have gotten no contact, if you will, with family um, or others who don't believe in their right to exist. And that, you know, I think that we can separate that. Um, but what you're talking about actually makes me think of um, Daryl Davis, mm -hmm. the musician um, and activist who, I mean, he, he did engage with people who didn't necessarily think he had a right to exist, right? He engaged with members of the Ku Klux Klan and through uh, discourse um, turned, managed to turn people away from extremism. That was certainly his choice and, and not everyone maybe, you know. And, 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 maybe that, you know, have that capacity. For right. sure. Right. Yes, and, and then, of course, you don't want to feel like you're putting your, your own life safety at risk. Um, right. Yeah. But, and but I think you can, you should, maybe we can and should draw the line at, at safety. And like, if we actually are, are you know, in fear for, for our lives or, or for our health. Yeah. 100%. Like, and, and again, none of, none of what I'm saying is, 
is to, um, you know, condemn people who have taken these steps. But it's just, you know, again, the people who had the greatest effect on me. So I'm going to mention one of them, this, this man, David Abbottball, um, who ran a blog called Julicious. And at this point in Westboro's ministry, at the time we were talking, you know, we were protesting Jews everywhere um, all the time. And we had no signs we, and a matching website, God hates Jews, or sorry, JewsKillJesus.com and signs that said God hates Jews and, and um, talking about Israel is going to be destroyed, all these things like, and, and, and the, um, he, he really took it in stride. He, he basically was like, he, I think what he was demonstrating was something really important, I think, for, um, for people generally, which is that we don't have to allow the opinions and beliefs of other people to determine our reality. Like, David knew that he didn't believe Westboro's ideology. He didn't believe we were right. He didn't believe we had access to some special truth that he didn't. And so he didn't let my... Um, my words and behavior um, affect his sense of himself and what he believed. Um, and again, that's, that's a skill, right? That I think, I think it's something that, and it's a posture that has to be kind of actively cultivated um, because, you know, we are social creatures, right? We, we were, are kind of wired, right? To, to think about and to worry about, you know, other people's opinions, to care about other people's opinions of us. Um, so I completely get it, but, but, so for him to be willing, and for David, uh, sorry, Daryl Davis, um, the black um, musician you were just referring to, um, who had this conversation with the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan, um, like that's an incredible thing. But it it doesn't even have to be like to that extreme, right? Any communication across these kinds of divides um, can have profound impacts on people, profound effects on people, um, and our willingness. The more of us who are willing and able to do it, the better which again is not to shame the people who don't. Um, and I'm just going to say again, I don't do that in every moment. I don't, I still reach out to my family. It's an incredibly painful thing to be separated from my family. I still love them dearly and they believe that they can have nothing to do with me. Um, and so, you know, don't engage, but, but I, I believe that I was changed by people who took the time and had, you know, were, were generous enough and, and had enough grace for me um, you know, to have those conversations and that I, I'm going to, I'm going to be willing to do that as much as possible in my own life as well. Mm. Megan, one thing that's really come through um, throughout our conversation today is that having, you know, perhaps living a, a life where you were surrounded by extremism, that you are able to very quickly recognize it, um, and recognize the signs of it in others. Um, as we try to repair, uh, our polarization in this country, what advice do you have for people, um, given that you have been so quick to recognize it, sort of work through that in your own life? Um, I mean, I think, I feel like I'm going to be repeating myself here, but the willingness to talk and to listen, right? Mm -hmm. And that can be a really, the listening particularly, can be a really difficult thing to do, especially when people are advocating ideas that you just find so destructive um, and incomprehensible. Um, but if we, can, if we can move to curiosity instead of judgment, um, you know, there's, 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 there can be an enormous amount to learn there. Um, you don't just, I mean, you don't just learn, I'm not saying you're gonna learn something from you know, the mouth of a conspiracy theorist um, that's gonna change your life and cause you to also be a conspiracy theorist, although I'm sure that I know that happens. Um, but when you approach those kind of conversations with curiosity, you can understand like what, how has this person gotten to this place that seems incomprehensible to me? And honestly, there's, the, again, I'm gonna go back to the, the game aspect of it, right? There, there can be, it's, it's kind of a puzzle. Like, what is it in the human mind, right? And what is it in this particular person's experience that has got, gotten them here? And under what circumstances would I be in the same position? Like, I think, you know, going back to, you know, what we know and how we know it and, and being willing to engage with other, um, other, other outside um, views and information that might show our position to be an error and to, and to be open to that. Um, I, I just I I find I find it all incredibly fascinating. I find those conversations fascinating. They can be frustrating for sure, um, but but if we want to make progress, it's not it doesn't happen 
through this kind of force and anger and, you know, pushing it's and resistance. Like it's, it's very funny to me. Um, I feel like maybe I'm getting a little bit off here. I, I, resistance, right. When in my parenting, like that's my, I come from a very authoritarian family, you know, where, um, you know, everything was decided for you. It's uh, emphasis on obedience. I, I mentioned earlier. Um, and it's, it's amazing to me when I look at my daughter and the, the way that she responds to the kind of attitude that I'm describing, this kind of generosity and care and understanding where she's coming from and affirming like, oh, yes, I understand in that situation, I also feel bad. <laughs> I also cry. Um, and how fast she moves beyond it. Whereas in my family, the kind of resistance, the kind of, you know, happy up, you know, stop crying, that this kind of, um, like, when we resist, we resist things like, the instinct is to resist. And often um, the best way out is not resistance, but acceptance and then finding a new path, like helping somebody find a new path. So, so I don't know if all that makes sense. It does. And it shows, um, it shows a great deal of empathy too, I think, which is important again to what you were talking about with recognizing the fundamental humanity in others um, and the importance of discourse. Thank you so much, Megan, for taking the time to share your experience and point of view with us. Polarization is certainly not unique to our time, but is a critical issue, and education clearly plays an important role in fostering understanding and in cultivating that discourse. So thank you so much. Thank you again for having me. It was really wonderful talking with you.